Hi everybody, JJ here with ASUS. And today I wanna to talk to you a bit about some tips and tricks that you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind when you go about building your PC. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Now, before I get into all the different tips and tricks in hand, I do wanna go ahead and give you one golden rule, and that's gonna to be to take it slow. There's no need to rush through the entirety of the build process. Go ahead and take your time. I would actually recommend that you take a couple of breaks. Make sure that you're referencing the actual documentation that comes included with all the different components so that you have an actual reference to make sure that you're going about each step correctly. And again, go ahead and go through the process slowly. You're better off to actually go through the process slowly and double check each one of the actual steps that you're going through as opposed to rushing through something and incorrectly executing one of those actual installation steps and then running into an issue later that you're gonna have to troubleshoot or debug. Next, let's go ahead and talk about screwdrivers. Now, there's a lot of different things to keep in mind here, so let's go ahead and try to run through it quickly. First and foremost, make sure that the tip is not blunted or burred in any way. You wanna make sure that it's sharp so that when it makes contact with the actual surface head for the screw itself, you don't have to worry about potentially over-torquing it or stripping that screw out. You're also gonna to wanna to make sure that the actual tips themselves are correct for PC building. So you wanna make sure to not use too large or too fine of a tip. My recommendation would be making sure to have a PH2 and a PH0 tip. These are the most common that you're gonna find in pretty much all standard PC builds. Now, in addition to those two tips, you're also ideally gonna to wanna to have a three different lengths when it comes to the actual shank uh, for the actual screwdriver. Now, why uh, will you wanna have essentially up to three different lengths? I'd say the main reason would be ultimately about reducing obstruction and improving visibility and potentially improving overall ergonomics. When you go about installing something, let's say like the motherboard inside the chassis, you'll find that it actually can be a bit more difficult to actually see the actual tip of the screw. And it just makes it much more difficult that when you go to actually uh, complete the mounting of that device, you might not clearly be able to see what you're attempting to screw in. You also might find that your hand might make an obstruction up against, let's say, the side of the chassis or maybe an adjacent cooler or something else along those lines. And when you have a longer shank screwdriver, you don't run into any of those issues. So it just really makes the experience that much more comfortable and that much better. Now, one other thing to keep in mind too is that also the handles themselves, I would generally recommend not having a full polymer plastic base handle. They tend to be a little bit harder to hold and a little bit more slippery. Now, one other thing to keep in mind will also be tips. Many users prefer a magnetic tip, and there's definitely nothing wrong with that. But keep in mind that sometimes magnetic tips can wear out over time, especially if they're under a lot of heat or in a direct sunlight. Uh, what you can do if, let's say, you already have a screwdriver that you like, is just get yourself a low-cost magnetizer. Uh, this essentially will allow you to go ahead and magnetize any tip for any screwdriver, and you're good to go. Uh, another recommendation for some of you out there will be to consider using a ratcheting screwdriver. This can be really advantageous if you're kind of unsure about how much force or essentially how much torque to apply to a screw to keep it locked in place. As opposed to let's say a manual screwdriver where you'll have to keep turning uh, to fix it in place. Uh, here you essentially can pretty much uh, just dial in uh, just the right amount and just ratchet that into place and you're good to go. You can also replace the tips here uh, for pretty much any type of screw that you're going to need when you go about PC building. For our next tip, it's gonna be all about organization. There's a lot of different options available to you, but they're pretty much just gonna be different types of trays. Um, my general recommendation for trays would be get yourself a couple of different types of magnetic trays. You can pretty much divvy up all your different types of screws. Uh, you can drop them in there, and as long as they're not, let's say, like aluminum or something like that, you don't have to worry about your screws falling out or rolling around anywhere, you're good to go. It's really, really convenient, and you can also get them in different colors, which is nice. If you don't wanna go that route, you can get yourself something like a standard, uh, you know, divided plastic um, container, and you can drop in all your screws in there, which can be really nice to just make sure that nothing gets mixed up. Another option might be something like this, a tray, uh, which also has dividers in there in terms of molded dividers where you can drop everything in. Uh, and last but not least, something like this, a larger tray, which works really well for, let's say, putting all your different types of, let's say, items in there. So things like your thermal compound, your cable ties, your screwdrivers, screws, or, or whatever you're gonna be utilizing. One thing to keep in mind is that with these traffic trays, many of them don't you have, um, let's say, an anti-slip base. So you wanna get yourself something that you can put on the underside of them to make sure that it minimizes the likelihood of it moving around or sliding around. And one last recommendation I'll make would be from a magnetic wristband, which is really convenient because if you don't want to keep reaching over to your screw tray, you can go ahead and put the screws that you're actively utilizing at that time for let's say, let's say mounting something like a fan or a cooler, put them on there. And then once you go ahead and get ready to install that device, you can just pull it right from there, grab your screwdriver, which if you've gone ahead and magnetize it, will be good to go and complete the installation.
For my next tip, you want to make sure that you've got enough surface area, essentially overall space to be able to complete your build. I would generally recommend about 32 to about 40 inches. Uh, the reason being is you want enough space to be able to lay down your chassis and still have the components kind of there right next to you. You want to make sure that it's level. That area doesn't essentially have any type of wobble or shake to it because you don't want anything kind of rolling off or moving out of place. I would also recommend making sure to use a bright surface area as opposed to something dark. The reason being is that sometimes uh, with a darker surface, it might be harder to see if let's say a screw or something like that uh, rolls around and you might not be able to easily see it. This would also apply to the area that's underneath the actual table or the surface that you're utilizing. So minimize trying to work on let's say something like a shag carpet or a darker colored carpet where it could be really hard to be able to see if anything falls. And last but not least, you do also want to keep in mind that when you set anything down on the surface that you're working with, you could actually be potentially scuffing it or scratching it. A good example of this would be actually your motherboard. Your motherboard, because it actually has pins on the back, if you were to lay it directly down on the actual counter or the surface and it were actually to move around, you could actually scuff or permanently damage the actual surface area that you're uh, working on. In that regard, that's where it's always advantageous to use something like the motherboard box and lay those devices on them first. Many users out there are going to be utilizing some form of a zip tie. Definitely nothing wrong with them. You can get them on all kinds of thicknesses as well as different types of lengths and also different types of colors, which is great for being able to isolate different areas, such as let's say your graphics card power as opposed to the motherboard power as opposed to your fans. The one thing that you do want to keep in mind though with a zip tie is that they generally cannot be readjusted after the fact. More expensive ones can, but most commonly most users are utilizing ones that cannot be. So if you want to make a readjustment, you're going to have to actually cut that zip tie and then reapply it. You also want to be very cautious to not essentially over tighten this zip tie because you can actually damage the internal wiring inside of the cable. And I've seen this happen before, so make sure you're cautious about that. An alternative and my personal recommendation would be using some form of a cable wrap. The cable wraps uh, can be easily adjusted after the fact. You can also get them in varying lengths and thicknesses and different colors. For our next tip, it's going to be all about the cables that are for the different types of components that you're going to have for your system. Namely, it's going to be probably for your fans as well as the power supply cables. You want to make sure before you actually go about installing them inside the system that you actually check the ends. And you want to make sure that you don't have any type of fraying, loose pins, or any type of damage that might be present. It can be far more difficult to actually verify this once everything's installed. And also, if you go ahead and make the connections with these actual faults in place, you could potentially have an issue that is unknown to you when you go about the actual troubleshooting or the debugging process. So it's far simpler to actually verify these in the very beginning. Now for our next tip, it also continues in the theme of those cables and a critical part to the PC building experience is going to be making sure that all those cables are flush. You want to make sure that they're fully flush against all their corresponding headers, whether that's going to be, let's say, on your graphics card or the motherboard or wherever they're going to be connected. Essentially, if they're not fully seated, it could cause an issue powering that device and having it work the way it's intended to. For our next tip, it's going to be about the mounting process for different types of components. For things, let's say, like your motherboard, let's say your uh, fans, or even, let's say, a CPU radiator uh, in terms of the actual AIO cooling solution, you're going to find that they have multiple mounting points. An example on this fan would be that there are four mounting points. I would recommend actually mounting uh, this fan uh, on opposing diagonal corners. So you would want to go ahead and put in one screw here and then another screw here. And the reason why is that that will help to keep it lined up correctly and not actually cause the actual uh, component to pop out of place because you're putting essentially too much pressure on one corner. For our next tip, it's going to be specifically for installing certain types of components. Take for instance, let's say your graphics card, your memory, or your processor. All these type of devices actually have specialized contact interfaces, which are going to be designed to be plugged into or essentially installed onto the motherboard. These specialized contact areas, essentially you always want to make sure to not have any direct contact with your hands or your fingers. The reason being is of course, because your hands have oils and different types of kind of sediment, dust debris, dander, different things like that, that you don't want to have on those contacts because they could potentially cause issues with how those devices are initialized and detected. For our next tip, it's going to be all about fans. For many of you, you're probably going to be installing multiple fans in your system, especially for the front portion of your system, where you might have two to three fans. Now, most of you might think, well, I'm going to need to go ahead and connect each one of those fans to a corresponding fan header that's on the motherboard. And this will entirely work, and it does have the advantage of offering individual control for each one of your fans. But an actual option that you have available to you is to use something like a PWM fan splitter cable or a hub. These are low-cost items that will allow you to go ahead and connect multiple fans to one header on the motherboard. The great thing about this is it simplifies cable routing and still allows you to control and power your fans. 
The one disadvantage, although it depends on your actual setup and your configuration preference, is, is that the actual set of fans that are connected to that splitter will all have the same output control signal. What essentially that means is if I have three fans connected to a splitter and connected to one header, they will all have the same control profile. So if I set something like standard or silent, all the fans are gonna run that way. The great thing is that you can also do this for things like RGB fans and RGB based devices, where if you have an RGB header on the motherboard, you can also use a splitter to be able to connect multiple RGB devices to one header. But just like the fans, they will all receive the same output control signal. So for our next tip, let's go ahead and quickly talk about airflow. If you've ever been wondering essentially about how to orientate the fan correctly so that you can account for the correct airflow for your system, which will of course vary depending on your setup and your preference, all you need to do is physically check the fan. The fan will actually have an arrow that indicates the actual airflow pattern for the fan itself. In most situations, you'll generally find that the back of the fan features some form of bracing design. This also helps to confirm that this is essentially the exhaust uh, pattern for the fan. So let's say if we were to install this in the front of our chassis, we would be bringing cool air in to the actual system. And then if we were mounted to, let's say the back of the chassis, we'd be taking that warmer air and then exhausting it outwards. And then for the top of the chassis, depending on how this fan is oriented, then you could either have it serve as an intake or as an exhaust. For our next tip, it's gonna be in relation to the actual back of the motherboard and its IO connectivity. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that before you install the motherboard, you install the included IO shield. This will be inside the box, so make sure to go ahead and separate it, and ideally just go ahead and install this before you get anywhere close to actually installing the motherboard inside the chassis. The main reason being is that you cannot install this after you've installed the motherboard. It would require you to remove the motherboard to then mount this back into the chassis. And this isn't just for aesthetic purposes, it does actually, actually provide uh, EMI and ESD protection. Now, if you've got a higher end motherboard, take for instance on this board, you will actually see that the IO shield is integrated onto the motherboard directly, which means that you don't have to worry about independently installing the IO shield. Now for our next tip, it's gonna be all about memory. When you go about installing memory, for most users and most builds, they're generally gonna have four memory banks. In those type of situations, there are gonna be two preferred banks. These are gonna be labeled directly on the motherboard, which you can visually reference. There'll be two asterisk markers indicating which are the two primary banks. Or you can also go ahead and reference the manual. That's where you're gonna to wanna to install your two DIMMs. Now, if you've got four DIMMs, then you can go ahead and fully populate and not worry about it because you're gonna be fully populating all the banks. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is that when you do physically install the memory, you do wanna make sure that it's evenly depressed on both sides and that the actual retention clip has locked in place. And last but not least, if the memory features an XMP memory profile, you will need to go into the UEFI BIOS to actually enable that profile and have that DRAM operate at its rated frequency and timings. For our next tip, let's go ahead and talk about mounting the motherboard. When you mount the motherboard inside the chassis, you'll find that there's actual mounting points that are on the motherboard that correspond to standoffs that are on the inside of the chassis. You need to make sure that the actual number of standoffs are the same number of mounting points that the motherboard has. If any standoffs are missing, you wanna make sure to go ahead and install those standoffs so that when you install the motherboard in place, it's correctly distributed and allows you to correctly mount it with no torsion and no flexing. So that wraps up our tips and tricks video. Hopefully you found it useful and interesting. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or feedback, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the comment section down below. And if you'd also like to see a follow-up video with even more tips and tricks, make sure to go ahead and let us know. While you're down there, if you can go ahead and hit the like and the subscribe button, that would be super appreciated. And we've got more PC DIY videos coming for you in the not too distant future. So with that, take care, take it easy, enjoy the rest of your day, and best of luck with your next build.